September 21, in the year of your Lord, 2016. Thanks for tuning in. Let's advance. Yo, again, I appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in. And I don't know. Sub title or the sub um, tagline for this show is the Broken Record Show. Because the same things keep going down, the same conditions. But. I know I'm about to get real unpopular because what's more tragic than the same abuses, the same oppression, it's the same canned responses that come out of the black community. And I don't understand how we can continue to demand, request, beg, expect, pray for this system to change, but we don't make fundamental changes within our community. And don't get me wrong, I'm not on some pull yourself up by your bootstraps nonsense. I'm not on some Bill Cosby nonsense saying that we just got to be better Americans. Oh, and that's pre-rape charges Bill Cosby. I know y'all, everybody ducking and hiding and acting before he was outed to be the predator that he was. But I knew he was a predator way back when. You know, I, didn't, I, I can't say that I had advance notice about his uh, rape allegations, but I definitely understood that um, he was an elitist a new Negro elitist who wanted to sustain the status quo because he greatly personally profited despite the, the massive immense suffering of our people. But anyway, from Oklahoma, Arizona, I mean, what, in North Carolina, I'm, it's worldwide. Worldwide. Oppression for, for African people. But again, that's nothing new. We have new devices to, to give us, you know, moment by moment replay of the atrocities. But these atrocities date back to the 1400s. It's been consistent. One of our uh, historians, and I forgive me for not having his name, he said, you know, ain't been the, 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 this land, this soil has not been free of murderous atrocities and oppression since the pilgrims landed on Pil uh, Plymouth Rock. And we, I don't, I, let, me, let me back it up a bit. Because I, I want to be rational. And I know that's hard to be because this, this is painful. But we cannot simply be reactionary. We disrespect ourselves. And worse, we undermine and betray uh, future generations. But before I, I go that, I got on my uh, I Support the Grenada Re Revolution shirt. Because 1983, so what, we're coming up, uh, the 19th was the, uh, uh, September 19th, uh, 1983, was the uh, assassination of the great Maurice Bishops and the other obliteration of the New Jewel movement, you know, the Equality, Justice, Freedom movement in Grenada by uh, Ronald Reagan, you know, he did to Grenada what... Uh, what um, Obama did to Libya, Somalia, Venezuela. But anyway, send this shout out to all Grenadians, um, the New Jill movement, revolutions. We're not going to forget any of our revolutions. And shout out to African World Order, a cooperative enterprise that uses its profit to fund non-revenue generating efforts, liberation efforts in our communities. You know, I'm proud to be you know, a part of, of that, that uh, cooperative um, shout out for this shirt. You know, even we think that a lot of our struggles are obscure, but resistance is never futile. And as long as our revolutionaries live on in our hearts, so do the struggle. And so does the insecurity of the systems and institutions of oppression. If they think they can do something like what they did in Grenada, 
or what they're doing to our brothers and sisters in the streets of America, if they think they can do it and it'll eventually be forgotten, then they're going to continue. There's no incentives because this system is entrenched enough. It has stolen enough wealth and resources and it has created enough false legitimacy where it can endure some uprisings, it can endure some riots, it can endure some reforms, it can endure putting some women in places of positions to kill us, putting black men in posi positions of power to kill us, to integrate the empire as long as the fundamental mission and trajectory of the empire remains the same. They don't mind putting colored folks or women or gays and trans people in positions to, to do their dirty work. And we think that's progress, that we got black men shooting us dead in the streets with badges on and lying and said they saw a gun when there wasn't one. When we got women in a position to kill us in cold blood, we think that's progress. I don't support any integrationist movement. And yes, the feminist movement is an integrationist movement. The gay rights movement is an integrationist movement. The black civil rights movement was an integrationist movement. And we get really offended saying when people start to say, well, don't compare, oh, like our movement was so moral. Like the, the civil rights movement was such a, a grand moral thing that, you know, it's basically saying we want to be equal with a genocidal racist oppression. And how do we think that would go? How do we not suspect, well, won't our children, uh, if we want equality with people that hate us, won't we begin to hate ourselves even more intensely? If we want equality with killers, won't that make our children killers? If we want equality with materialist, greedy, avaricious people who put fiat currency above human life and the ecosystem would make, I mean, we wanted equality with our lessers, with our moral lessers, with our cultural lessers. What do we think the outcome would be? And I know a lot of them thought, well, maybe because this is what happened, a lot of the oppression would get shipped overseas and we could become imperialist. We could come become petty bourgeoisie. And some of us have. And the few of us who have will defend this omnicidal system to the end. The bitter, bloody, starving, burning, nuclear radioactive end. So I don't support any integrationist struggle because all you do is get a black person on the other side of that policeman's gun. Get a woman on the other side of that policeman's gun. They just celebrated the first openly gay lieutenant general in the U.S. military. Or openly trans. It's even more progressive. An openly transgender uh, lieutenant general in the U.S. military. That's progress. So now that guy or that woman, I'm not sure. I think it was a trans woman. So she gets to sit behind an air-conditioned office and order the death of black and brown people across the globe using weapons of mass destruction. That's progress. So I don't support any integrationist struggle. I support liberationist struggle. I don't think getting equal standing, equal opportunity, and full integration with our oppressors is progress. It's regression. Obama was a regressive move, and we're, we're suffering the outcomes of that. And we're so keen on, we're very keen on how Obama has inspired us. Obama didn't just inspire us. You know, you think inspiration only works one way? You know, you can only be positively, no, in, inspiration worked both ways. So in, Obama inspired white folks more aggressively, more intensively, and white races in particular, white nationalists, he inspired them too. He motivated them to work hard. He motivated white nationalists to, to, to strive stronger and to hold stronger too. And that they hope, the white nationalists, the white races have hope for change too. But they just hoping for, for more white power. More power to, to, to murder us with impunity. But we don't look at that. I don't think we acknowledge that. And we were like, good, you know, let the white races be mad. You know, what's that, that mean, that song? I understand, get mad, you mad, you mad. Remember that uh, popular meme uh, with uh, Michelle and Obama? With that look, they were like, mm, with their faces kind of tuned up and it was like, you mad, are they mad? Yeah, they were mad. 
mad enough to, to, to buy record amounts of guns, to buy record amount of ammunition. They were mad enough where state legislatures all over this country redrew uh, districts. They gerrymandered districts where they were electing white ring judges. They were mad where they were inspired white nationalists, neo-Nazis to, to join the U.S. military, to, to, to enlist in police academies across. Yeah, they mad. And they had the help of white elites, white billionaires. They had the help of highly well-funded think tanks, Heritage Foundation, and other very well-funded think tanks or white nationalist scholars. We think, you know, it ain't just toothless people sitting in uh, trailer parks that, that are building this, this system. So yeah, they mad, and we mocked the white, angry, white, insecure white folks, but they got mobilized. And I'm not saying we got to in any way behave in such a way as not to offend racist, not to offend white nationalists, but as George Jackson said, if you are provoking, if you're poking at the hornet's nest, if you are mobilizing against the interest of the elites and you're not prepared for their retaliation, then you are either stupid or you have a death wish. Which is it? Obama supporters, were y'all stupid or did y'all have a death wish? Y'all put a black man in, 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 at the helm of a racist white nation with no fundamental platform, with no fundamental strategy of, of uh, driving him to the left. Before he was elected, he basically said, there is no black America. There is no white America. There's just America. So before y'all even elected him, he basically said, I'm not going to represent for y'all. Here, here's a picture of me and, uh, and Shasha doing a little ballroom dance. Here's a picture of me and Michelle in a highly stylized propaganda photo that shows off her derriere. Here's me singing a little Al Green for y'all. Here, I'll come up to your, your schools. I'll come to Chicago in a violent, saturated uh, 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 community plagued by violence. And I'll come to Hyde Park, historic Hyde Park High School, and tell black youth about how they need to stop violence while I'm the one with the kill list. When I'm the one signing weapons deals to, Af to, to nations openly involved in genocidal uh, campaigns against native populations. I'll sell more weapons than any other president in history. I will sell weapons to, to, war, to, to Saudi Arabia engaged in wars of aggression. Israel engaged in wars of aggression. But I'm going to tell black youth to put the gun down unless you enlist in the military. And then pick up the gun, pick up the remote control joystick for the drone, pick it all up. But if you're engaged in violence on your own behalf, put the gun down. Yeah, he'll do that for us. He'll come to the, the NAACP and talk about where are the black fathers. And I haven't heard him when he, because he speaks whenever there's a mass shooting. That mass shooting in Connecticut, he didn't ask where that white boy's father was. He never mentioned Dylan Root's father. But he comes to black people and say, where are the black fathers? You know where the black fathers is. They were your homegirl put them in prison. Or they're in the streets unable to be employed because your homegirl, Hillary Clinton, and his bimbo chasing, and not my words, y'all don't like that bimbo talk? You get at your hero, the other war criminal y'all love so much, Colin Powell. You want to know where black fathers? Talk to the Democratic National Convention and the Democratic leadership. Don't ask black folks where black fathers are. They wear your, the Democratic Party has put them in cooperation and allegiance with the Republican Party. That's where we is. And you know it. But anyway, so where do we stand here? We're going to keep doing this song and dance. The Constitution, back when we weren't even human, had written, embedded in the Constitution, its opportunities and rights for you to protest, for you to gather. So if you're rebelling, if you're reacting, if you're resisting within the parameters set by your resistor, it's like two fighters get into the ring and one fighter gets to dictate all the moves that the other fighter can and can't use. And then that uh, fighter in opposition says, okay, I will fight you according to the rules you established. I guess I got to play the new black national anthem.
Because I've been trying to pick, because I don't like uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing. See, I like the U.S. National Anthem because it's accurate. It's a song about bombs bursting in air, celebrating the mass slaughter of other people. Very appropriate. But lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring with the harmony of liberty. We ain't about liberty. Why are we going to lie to the world about what we about? So based on our collective response to ongoing atrocities and genocidal repression, I vote that we take You Can't Win from The Wiz, sung by the multi-talented Michael Jackson, and make that the new Negro national anthem. You can't win, you can't make it, and you can't get out of the game. Can you imagine every time we show up at church, every time we show up at a baseball game, every time we had any occasion, oh, every February, you know, it'll be blasting all February long. And the song came out, you can't win, you can't make it, and you can't get out of the game. Now, I believe we could win if we had, but we don't want to win. Where are we going to find better accommodations than this? So, you know, let me know. Maybe y'all got a better song. Or maybe we'll get one of our gifted artists. Now, T.I. is engaged in revolutionary cosplay, and he put out a brilliant video. So maybe he can, can pin a new uh, Negro National Anthem for us. Thank you, Michael Jackson. Thank you, Wiz. You know. And in February, for you who acknowledge Black History Month, I'm going to make You Can't Win, You Can't Make It, You Can't Make It, can't get out of the game. The new Negro national anthem. And the basic message of the song is things stay the same. This ain't the first time we are blood are run in the streets. It's not the last. You know. Or wait, I, I got another I got another candidate. How about on the alert, Queen Medja? And again, if you're listening live, you need to go to 24.com. Or you can go to um, the website, Facebook page, Q4, the web, uh, web page, and uh, you can listen live, stream, you can watch video on YouTube. So there are several sources, but maybe for the more conscious members of the community. How about pun the alert? Africans, be on the alert. Babylon, I treat you like dirt. Africans, be on the alert. Babylon, I treat you like dirt. Policeman, on the alert. But where the criminal? Anyway, I don't know. Forgive me. But here's the bottom line. From Amos Wilson to Marcus Garvey, have not just preached or advocated. It's been demonstrated. We'll have to fundamentally change our behaviors, our relationship to the system in order to change the system. This system, their greatest scholars, their most patriotic members of their society have to admit this is a predatory system, a predatory culture. Racism is ingrained and fundamental to the self-identity of this society. So there is no reforming. There's nothing you can write on a piece of paper and try to enforce that will change that. So we have to not try to awaken races, reform races, or outlaw races. We have to erect hard, fast, and maneuverable barriers to racism. We have to reduce our vulnerability to races. And that requires us to have independent infrastructure. That requires us to erect the both legal and material frameworks for sanctioning those who act against our best interests. Because racists are just like aggressive dogs. They can be trained. Racists hate Jews as much as they hate us. But they don't shoot Jewish children in the street. And it is not because Jews are lawful. If you look at their websites, if you follow their rhetoric, 
They love this book called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, where they believe the Jews control everything. They call the United States a ZOG, Z-O-G, a Zionist occupied government. And but all of that, when the average white nationalist puts on a badge and puts a holster on his belt and puts his gun in there and hops in that patrol car. And when he engages a Jewish individual and despite all of his hatred, all of his personal views align are out the window and his behavior aligns with what the status quo. Officers are not a revolutionary force. You will not find anywhere in history where police officers, low-level bureaucrats, have been an engine of social change. They are walls. So the police will go with the status quo. The police in Europe don't kill black people as much. They don't even carry guns because the status quo is different. Not because they're more loving, more caring, more professional than the cops or the white people anywhere else. So we need a cultural revolution to change our fundamental relationship. They know if they shoot other people despite who they hate, they are also cowards. They're only going to attack and demean those who they can get away with. They don't like Asians. One of the most popular sayings in the United States up until the 80s was, you don't stand a Chinaman's chance. Some of the biggest race riots and racial battles that have been fought in the, on this soil, especially on the West Coast, have been between Chinese migrant, Chinese rail workers, and whites. But they don't aggress against them as much. I mean, they're, against all these groups, there's subtle psychological attacks. But what I'm saying is, racist attacks have no direct correlation to the personal hatred and, and prejudices of the police officer. When the police officer acts in capacity of a police officer, they act strictly according to the status quo. A lot of these police officers are working class. They understand putting their hate to their racial insecurity, their pathological racial insecurity aside, many of them understand that the CEOs are screwing them over. But they're not going to uh, spread CEOs across the hood of the car. Because I look at their list of enemies. And, and, and the white nationalists are very clear on who their list of enemies. They don't like liberals. They don't like Jews. They don't like anybody that's not Aryan. And, and, and really Aryan to them is the phenotype of white. They don't like a lot of people. But then when you look at the list of people that they don't like in their own literature in their own speeches, in their own ideology, in their own culture. But you look at the people who come under their vicious attacks, it don't line up. Why? Because the people that they don't like who lack cohesive power, institutional power, organizational power, global power, the people they don't like that have ability to fight back, they don't mess with them. Why is the United States not in North Korea right now? Because they love North Korea or care more about North Korean lives than they care about Iraqi lives? Why is it the U.S. got boots on the ground or dropping drones in Iran right now? Because they care more about Iranian sovereignty than they do about Libyan sovereignty? No. Like all parasitic predatory creatures, they attack the weakest target. You know? So what we need, and what we've been calling for since the 60s, we need power. We need power, not reactionary power, though, because we have reactionary power. We can burn down a city, which increases the GDP in the long run. You know, the property and currency spectators, the institutional investors on Wall Street, they like they make money off of social upheaval. Whether it's the Arab Spring or the Cincinnati riots or the Venezuelan uh, food. And, and energy crisis, the white man gets paid off of all of that. The white elites, to quote, you know, King Kanye, Mr. Picasso, Mr. Einstein, Mr. Malcolm X of our generation. That's what he said himself. And uh, so, how do we react in a way that the elites don't profit? And they don't care about a few cops, 
you know, because that um, maximum compensatory justice, they don't fa care about a few cops losing their lives. They don't care about the police on the ground losing their stability. They don't care about the so-called good cops getting enveloped in with the bad cops. How do I know? Because they send their boys overseas to die by the tens of thousands. Right now in the United States, we have between 22 uh, veterans committing suicide a day, and it doesn't even get in the news. The U.S. military is basically, uh, has, has, they say what? If, you, if you're a woman and you join the military, you're more likely to be raped and sexually assaulted by your allied soldier than you are to be killed or maimed or even looked at by your enemy combatant. There's an epidemic of rape and sexual assault. And the, the number one, the, the civilian society has an epidemic of sexual assault and rapes. And when you go into the military, which is a microcosm of the larger society, it, it balloons even further. It's unimaginable. And they said we can never get accurate statistics because, you know, a lot of these women have to go to their go up the chain of command and always up the chain of command is some, you know, predatory authoritarian white male who, or black male like Colin Powell who's going to shut it down. So the suicide, so, and they've done nothing. We remember under the uh, Bush regimes when they went into that famous uh, military hospitals and had open sewage leaking and rats and vermin running through. So don't think, oh, if, if, if the police attack us, it's going to harm their officers. They don't care. They don't care. You think, you know, the, the billionaires, the elites, they don't care. Do we remember when all those soldiers in the first Gulf War under Bill Clinton and, and, and the first George Bush and they got exposed to, to uh, all the chemical weapons they called Gulf War Syndrome, they didn't give them any money? The Congress just voted not to give any more money to the first responders for 9-11. I mean, they don't care. They're willing to die. They're willing to send, you know, droves and droves of their own children to maintain their ill-gotten gains. So how do you address such a system? You know, there is a way. We can win. We can make it. We can get out of the game. But, what we, but the problem is, a lot of things that we've become accustomed to, a lot of the status that we've secured, a lot of the comforts that we enjoy living even though we're at the bottom, we're at the bottom of the top. The United States is that global hegemon. It is the sole global superpower. It is the largest empire in the history of the world. And it has forced at gunpoint, at missile point, at nuclear bomb point, the rest of the world to align their economies in a way that suits the interests of the U.S. The U.S. dollar is a petrodollar. And they go to these nations and say, hey, the world's Primary fundamental energy sources have to be bought and sold and traded in U.S. dollars. So you have to do this currency conversion, which, de which is extremely disruptive. You know, all the, the world's economic eggs are forced to be in one volatile, unstable basket. So this is a global empire. And one thing, even if you're comfortable, even if you got your degree, you got the resources to pay your mortgage and your car note. And your children are in the best little indoctrination factory that we call uh, schools in the world. Do you know the fate of all empires? And the bigger the empire, the bigger the collapse. And you read Dmitry Orlov. And Dmitry Orlov is a scholar who lived through the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Then he migrated to the United States and he said the conditions here are more ripe for collapse than they were in, in, in Mother Russia. And he said that the, infra the fundamental infrastructure to endure the collapse and come out of the collapse don't exist here like they did in Russia. When Russia went into the collapse, number one, it was a homogeneous society. And I know I'm going down a rabbit hole. And I know I'm not going to be able to dedicate the time to this particular issue that I need to, but so be it. And I want to give some time to Maurice Bishop and talk about you know, the Caribbean Confederation. There's so much, but... Dmitry Orlov said, when Russia collapsed, number one, it was a homogeneous society, meaning it was like 97% white people, people with the same skin color, the same fundamental culture. So even though there were a few Afro-Cubans roaming around there, they, they were not a, a statistically significant number of people. 
and you know you had uh, some Mongol descendants, Asian type, but basically Russia is a, a racially homogeneous society. Number one, number two, there was zero unemployment at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union because it was a Soviet Union. It was a communist state. There was no homelessness in the Soviet Union. There was poverty, but there was no homelessness. There was very little, there was no open market. There was no speculation. So there was no property market. So even though these things were bad from a Western point of view, when a society collapsed, there was already a tone of cooperation and sharing. Even though the elite of the communists, the, the political elites, because in the United States we have an economic elite, in the Soviet Union, there was a political elite. So your status went up by the amount of money you had in the West. Your status went up by your affiliation and, and rise within the party. But then both sides had corrupt elites. But the, the peasants, the citizens, the commissars, you know, the comrades, I mean, they had a different fundamental culture. They had a culture of independence. So when the collapse came, they didn't cannibalize each other. But here... You already have chaos in pro under prosperity, you know. And I'll tell you, I we live in Illinois, which had some of the strictest gun laws. But they're only in in Illinois, literally within the city limits of Chicago, you cannot buy a slingshot, let alone a, a, a handgun. But you get on the on the highway going in any direction, south or north. You can't really go well. You can go west to Indiana. Or, or, or southern Michigan, you get on the highway and drive anywhere 20 miles outside of the black community and all you will see is guns and armories. And you won't just see gun shops, you will see everyday uh, accountants, ministers, Boy Scout troop leaders, you know, meth heads. White folks are in there buying record amount of guns. Look at the, uh, the, uh, the Wall Street Dow Jones Industrial uh, averages, and, 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 and look at the gun manufacturing, Taurus, Smith & Wesson. They are making money hand over foot. Look at membership into the NRA. It is ballooning. And the NRA is a racist club for people who don't like to be openly racist. So it's the Republican Party. So you don't want to join the white knights, the Christian knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, the... Ku Klux Klan is a Christian organization, and until God sends a lightning bolt or calls a press conference to say that they ain't real Christians, I'm not going to listen to some Negro Christian tell me about how the Ku Klux Klan ain't real Christian. Tell your boss to talk to me or his son, because if I don't hear it from the higher authority, if, if, a, if, a, if a racist says I'm a Christian, and then I look up, I don't see a lightning bolt, and I'm like, you're a Christian until God says otherwise. So yeah, they real Christian. So... You got to claim your set, you know. Yeah. Black Christians, you follow a racist God or a God that tolerates racist. You know, that's it. I didn't do it. I'm not a Christian. I ain't the one that did it. That's on you. But anyway, uh, if you don't want to join the Ku Klux Klan, neo-Nazis organization, openly racist organizations, they have what they call dog bristle racist organizations. You can join the Heritage Foundation. You can even, I think there's a new Citizens Council. There's a Tea Party. But all these white folks is well-armed. And some are more organized than others. And guess what? A lot of these liberals, a lot of these Democrats, a lot of these feminists, when the lights go out, when the water faucet isn't, is spitting sewage, you know, when, when, the, when the elites have all gathered up their stuff and moved to Dubai, and you'll find that a lot of elites, a lot of white billionaires have uh, secondary citizenship. You know, I heard in uh, Chile they, they've got this mountaintop reserve, you know, that's like a global bomb shelter for, for billionaires. You know, we already have several white elites who have moved to Dubai. Their money's in the Cayman Islands. They got residents in Dubai and stuff. So when all this go down, a lot of these tree-hugging, kumbaya, you know, dreadlock-wearing, tattooed-up white folks are going to have to pick a side. And generally, they go with, you know, their phenotype. Historically. 
historically. You know, when the crops start to fail, when the, when the summers come, and you're getting 120 degree weather, you know, because ecological collapse always precedes, um, not always, but if you have ecologic collapse, you're going to have economic turmoil. And when you have economic turmoil, you're going to have political turmoil. And when that ball starts rolling, and there's, like I said, there are a lot of legitimate white scholars who ain't got no love for black folks, ain't got no particular interest in the black struggle. So they just tell them the truth. They're not trying to manipulate us. You know, you got Morris Berman, another one of the best, most slept on white scholars, Morris Berman. That's all he writes about. Is in, uh, in one of his best books is Why America Failed. He said the collapse is already in motion and it's irreversible. And, you know, Obama's administration has basically went to the dam and put tape and stuck his finger in all these little minor leaks. But the dam's about to break. And so what did he do? He gave up his U.S. citizenship. Now he lives in Mexico City. Ken O'Keefe, the former Marine who went to Iraq to, 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 to avenge 9-11 and got there and was like, whoa, this is all a lie. He's renounced his U.S. citizenship. I think he's somewhere in the Caribbean. When you look at the people, the real strategists, the, the, the scholars and the military people or ex-military, ex-intelligence people, a lot of these people who have access to classified information, they're jumping ship. And so it'll just be us and the poor whites. And we're going to have some, and that's a thing I got to tell you socialists. You know, shout out to my socialist brothers and sisters. I love y'all. But y'all better get on this Pan-African kick. There's socialism over here, but it's, it's, it's African socialism. It's scientific socialism. Because I'm telling you, them white liberals, you know, when, 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 a, when, you know, when a truck full of well-armed redneck shows up and says, you know, if, if, you, if you got black skin, send them out. They're going to turn to you like, gee, you know, Mustafa, we love you, but. <laughs> anyway, all this doom and gloom, but hey. That's the mood I'm in, and I apologize. Let's go to a musical break. We're going to come back and talk about something other than because I'm on this train of thought, kick. There are some specific things I want to talk about. I think I, I want to talk about specifically what we should do or need to do. And one thing we have to do is understand that it's not just the police. And if we just focus on the police, listen, do you think racist? I'm a racist. So I'm going to go join the police. No, it is the doctors, the family services, social workers, the school bus drivers. There are racist white aggressors in every area of society. I'm going to go into media and marketing. I'm going to go into black schools and do a Teach for America grant. A lot of these teachers, if you gave them a gun and a badge, they would be killing our kids. And a lot of these cops, if you give them a degree and a, and a, and a uh, notepad, they're killing our children psychologically. But, you know, we went into our evolutionary, how our brains are hardwired by our evolutionary development. So if it bleeds, it leads. And the reason if it bleeds, it leads, because in, when we were lower on the food chain, before we were anointed by God to be dominion, to take dominion over the earth, our more primitive ancestors were not at the top of the food chain. So there were certain animals, and we lived in certain ecosystems where we were preyed upon by animals, by real carnivores. And so our, those who were more gay paid more attention to threats, lived longer. Those who tended to ignore threats, because if you were in the prehistoric era and you were like, I'm on my positivity, my chakras are aligned, and I'm not giving energy to anything negative, then you got ate up. Yomp. You was done. And the dude that was skittish, like, nah, I pay attention to negativity. My eyes are drawn. You notice how something moves in the corner of your eyes. You, you can't control yourself. If you see a, a motion in the distance, you jerk your head. But when the last time humans as a whole, as a, a whole population, had to worry about lurking creatures jumping out of bushes to eat us? You know, there are some. I mean, you go to certain parts of rural India and Pakistan. Oh, India and Pakistan. 
Oh my God. Um, I gotta do my people. I gotta do better people. Cause there's so much going on. I gotta do more detailed outlines so I can get to everything. I mean, what, the, the systems and institutions of white supremacy are like going a little too fast for me. I can't keep up with all the men. But anyway, you notice if you see something rustling out of the corner of your eye, it catches your attention. And if you're driving down the street and there's a car accident, you're going to watch it. When we see danger, when we see threat, when we see potential danger, when we see imaginary danger, it draws our attention. They make a movie with explosions and high drama, it's a blockbuster. If they make a movie about love and human e e empathy, a few bleeding hearts will go see it. But this isn't really negative. This isn't a bad thing. We need to focus on what's bad. You know, if you have a severe pain in your gut, but you're going to say, well, my head feels fine. No, you're going to be like, I got to find out what's in my gut. Paying attention to the negative, giving attention and energy to what's wrong in the world, in your life, in your body, will save your life. I'm not even sure how I got off on that. But don't, because I see a lot of people say, I'm not going to share these, these photos of atrocities anymore. Because I don't want to make my people be disheartened. If reality discourages you, then crawl up in a ball. I want to know what the deal is. I want to know what's going on. So if you're a freedom fighter, continue to share the, the, the atrocities. Continue to expose the illegitimacy, Ill illegitimacy of the state. Continue to raise the contradictions within capitalism and, and democracy. Don't try to shelter our people from reality. And that doesn't mean I'm saying there's some positive stuff too. And, but positive is subjective, because I don't think it's positive when a black man gets a scholarship to Harvard. Our most brilliant black minds are sent off to some of the most heavily uh, racist institutions to cultivate their mind. But if y'all think it's positive, share it all, man. I mean, we need to become intimate with reality. We need to get all up in reality, encode ourselves in reality. We have to be reality-based. And we have to act based off of rationale. And I'm not saying I'm anti-emotion. I'm all for it. Because when you are reality based, when you are rational, you're going to be emotionally stimulated. And then you say, huh, this angers me. And then you, get, then you engage that emotion. Why does this particular thing provoke this to particular emotion? You say, oh, this is righteous anger. This is appropriate anger. And I will use this anger to drive me, to motivate me. Or you say, well, I ain't got no real reason to be caught up. Like, my people dying in the street, I'm pissed off. This enrages me. So let's get organized. Use that fire, that adrenaline to, to organize. But then you look at something else. Gays getting married and using transgender people using bathrooms. This enrages me. Well, okay, fine. But say, okay, in a society where... Every ecosystem is in rapid decline, where our people are under a systematic ongoing campaign of genocide from the elites, in a society where black youth are dying at a pandemic rate, where we got infant mortality, maternal mortality that is at the rates of a third world uh, nation, but yet there are the infrastructure and the resources and the know-how to prevent this. So our deaths are politically mandated, is a policy choice. I don't care who's in the bathroom. You know, I'm not looking over in the next stall to see what the next person's equipment is. So if that angers you, then you have to say, well, I need to do some re-examination, re-prioritization. Re but if it's righteous anger, you know, that's why the mind is so magnificent. We always work and it's always calculated. They still haven't built a, a computer or a processor that can engage in independent thought, creative thought. They're working on it like hell. I mean, talk about black folks have self-hate. Western culture is the most self-hating uh, ideology and way of relating to the world ever created. But anyway, shout out to that fascist that just shot that brother. I hope you uh, integrationists are proud. We fought for black cops, and now black cops get to be as fascist as everyone else. Oh. Thank y'all for tuning in live.
I'm about to sign off on live, but the show will continue for another hour or more. So tune in q4.org, Q4 Facebook page. You can also listen live and you can find this archive at diallokenyatta.com.